God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me read again the first couple of verses. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, chief priests and elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? It's a question that's important in so many different areas of life. Who's in charge? Who's in charge here in the school? Teachers or the students? Who's in charge in the home? The kids or the parents? Who's in charge in the city, in the county, in the state? The federal government. As nice as it would be to think that we can just all get along and live together without someone being in charge, we all know practically that's not possible. What if there was no government and taxes were just on the honor system? You think that would really work? Somehow, I don't really think so. What if there was no boss at work? Everyone just did whatever they wanted. How's that going to work? You'd have people going in all these different directions with no focus, no real goal in mind, right? It's just not going to work. We need to have someone in charge. And yet, at every age and stage of life, we rebel against that, don't we? Kids, they, they rebel against parents and teachers. Teenagers, well, they don't like being told what to do. But to be fair to teenagers, do any of the rest of us like being told what to do? Not if we're honest, at least. This is really a good question for us to ask spiritually. Who's in charge? Jesus had been preaching the gospel in the temple area, and the chief priests and the elders come up to him and they ask him, by whose authority, who told you to come and do this? Well, Jesus turns the tables on them and says, well, I'll ask you a question. You answer mine, and I'll answer yours. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? And they, they talk it over amongst themselves, and you can see they're, they're just trying to play the situation. If we see from heaven, if we say from heaven, then Jesus is going to legitimately ask us, well, why didn't you believe him? But if we say what real, we really think, if we say from men, all the people are going to hate us. So here you have these spiritual leaders full of integrity. Oh, wait, maybe they're not, because they dishonestly say, we don't know. Well, doesn't that really get to the heart of why Jesus didn't answer their question? They weren't even going to admit John the Baptist's authority. So if they're denying that, they're going to deny the far greater authority that Jesus claims as their Savior, as their God. Jesus goes on to tell them a parable to illustrate this truth. Two sons, both of whom the father goes to and says, go work in the vineyard today. First one, no! No! And you can kind of see his conscience working on him, recognizing, leading him to see that that was wrong. And in repentance, he goes and does it. Second son says, yes, sir, right away, sir. But he never goes and does it. And the question's very simple, very straightforward. Which one actually listened? Which one actually did what the father asked? Well, the first one. This is good food for thought for you and me. Faith is vitally important. It is the only way that we're saved by grace through faith. And yet, as James says in his letter, faith without actions is dead faith. In, in 2 verse 17, James says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. What James is saying is that faith, the words that we say, if they don't translate into changed thoughts, Changed attitudes, changed behaviors. In other words, if your faith is just something that comes out of your mouth and doesn't change any part of your life, that's not really faith at all, is it? It's a dead faith. Well, this is exactly what Jesus is illustrating for the chief priests and the elders. They're the ones that eagerly said yes to God's law, yes to God's command, and then they proceeded to ignore everything God said and do whatever they wanted. And Jesus, he uses this shocking picture, and yet it's true. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the lowest of the low in society, you know what? Those are the very ones that recognized their own sin, knew that they could not get to heaven on their own, heard that gospel promise, grabbed onto it, and believed. 
And you put yourself in these religious leaders of Israel. Put yourself in their shoes. This has got to be shocking for Jesus to tell them, look, the prostitutes are getting to heaven before you are. And yet, still in stubborn, your stubborn arrogance, you refuse to repent. By the way, there's definitely a lot of food for thought there in how we tend to look at other people and judge them too. Um, often those who are in open sin, their own conscience is convicting them. They need to hear the gospel and grab hold of that promise. Well, it brings us to the question, whose authority do we recognize? Do we recognize the Bible as God's word and an authority over our lives? It's easier and easier in the world today to pay lip service to the Bible as God's Word and yet really deny its power. We believe the Bible is God's Word, but it has mistakes. We believe the Bible is God's Word, but it was written by men. We believe the Bible is God's Word, but we're more enlightened than they were now, and we're more progressive. And so not all the applications are the same. And I'm not. And yet you see a common thread through each of those statements with a but. Isn't it really emptying God's word of any of its power? Because then I can, I can say well, whatever I don't like, I can find a reason to say that's not really part of God's word. That's a mistake or that's whatever the reason is, right? What happened to all scripture is God breathed? Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Either the Bible is entirely God's Word, without mistake, and therefore we should listen to it, or if there's mistakes in it, then it's not God's Word. It cannot be both. Now, this is why such a simple truth is so, so vitally important for you and me. Let's just say for a moment that there are mistakes in the Bible. How do you know what's a mistake and what's not? pretty subjective thing, isn't it? And that's what it ends up being in other churches that deny the Bible's inspire. It's a very subjective thing. In fact, let me go even farther. If there are mistakes in the Bible, how do you know a single one of God's promises are true? How do you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? How do you know that God raised him to life again? How do you know that he's gone to heaven to prepare a place for us? How do you know that he's going to keep his promise to be with us always, even to the very end of the age? In fact, if we argue such a thing, that ends up emptying God's Word of all of its power. There's no comfort in any promises God has made if there are mistakes in His Word, if it is not an authority over all of us in our lives. Praise be to God, we know that it is His Word that is without mistake and that all of His promises are true. And yet, we do need to recognize that many people in the world today are more and more like the chief priests and the elders when it comes to the Bible. See, Paul, in writing about the last days, he has this to say, that people will have a form of godliness, but really deny its power. Does that seem to be true in the world today? Everyone is religious, right? And yet, more and more people, they, they refuse to take any kind of stand as to this is what God says. This is what the Bible means. And they, well, really the thinking goes like this. And not that anyone would ever say this out loud, but I, I mean, think about it this way. If I actually admit that the Bible is without mistake, then that means that I'm admitting it has authority over every part of my life, even when I don't agree with it or like what it says. And yet if I say there's mistakes in it, then whenever I don't like something, I can just argue it's a mistake. See how that goes? We want to be in charge, don't we? We want to control our lives. We want to be our own boss, not only in life, but spiritually speaking as well. And I know some of you are your own boss, or have been, and uh, I just want to think about that for a moment, because from the outside looking in, have you ever thought about being your own boss? Would that be cool? From the outside looking in, it sounds like there's a lot of cool things about it, and there are. 
but you don't also don't think about all the headaches and all the struggles and challenges of being your own boss, right? So you got all the paperwork and taxes and dealing with employees and hiring and maybe even firing and trying to get good quality employees and trying to keep enough work for your employees and on and on, right? We also want to be our own boss, spiritually speaking. How does that work for us? Not well if you try it. Let, let me just ask, do you ever confuse good in this life with eternal good? I, I think as Americans, that's a very common mistake we fall into. Y you know, life never seems to go smooth, but when it does, does it seem like God's showing a little favor to you and God's happier, God's more pleased with you? That's a false assumption, right? That, that's mixing up eternal good with temporal good right now, and yet we do that frequently, don't we? We think, well, whatever's good for me right now, that's also going to be good for me eternally. Is it? Is it? Well, let's just think about this for a moment. If God blesses faithfulness with earthly material goodness, what does that say about the 11 apostles that were executed for their faith? 11 out of 12 of them died for their faith. It's got to be some food for thought, doesn't it? What about so many people in the Bible that we know face suffering and hardship for their faith? In fact, in Psalm 116, God says, Precious in the, Lord, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Isn't that just striking? Isn't that shocking? How can God say the death of his saints is precious? Because he's calling them home to him. Because the goal is not a good, perfect life here on earth. The goal is eternity with our God in heaven. And so that's why God says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, because that's God fulfilling his word and bringing those saints home to him forever in heaven. That's definitely not something we can understand according to our own wisdom, but can only be understood in faith. I guess the real question we need to ask ourselves today is, do we recognize Jesus' authority? It's an important question because if we don't recognize Jesus' authority, how can we be comforted He's washed away our sins? How can we be comforted that there is a place waiting for you and me in heaven? How can we be comforted that He is going to be with us always, even to the very end of the age? How can any of God's promises bring any comfort to us at all if we do not recognize Jesus' authority? Or maybe on the other side, maybe you say Jesus has authority, but disagree with certain things he says or different, certain applications. Well, really, think about that. Isn't that really just another way of denying Jesus' authority? If Jesus only has authority when you agree with him, is that really authority? Do you start to see where I'm going with this? Either Jesus is God and has complete authority, or he isn't. Our second lesson from Philippians chapter 2 today says God exalted him to the right hand and gave him the name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is in charge, and how comforting that message is for you and me. That means His words are true. His promises are true. The forgiveness that He won for us on the cross is true. The resurrection from the dead is our resurrection that we will have one day. His promise to come and take us home to be with Him in heaven is one that will be true as well. All of God's promises are yes in Jesus Christ. So which son are you? The one that says yes and doesn't follow through? The one that says no and later changes his mind and repents? If we're honest, I think at times we've been both, right? Fair statement? So often we say yes to what God says and then we struggle to follow through with it. Other times we rebel and, and yet then in repentance submit to what God says. My encouragement to each and every one of you today is to continue to live in that repentance. And really, that's a struggle. Because we want repentance to be a one-time thing. One and done, right? 
And yet, repentance needs to be a daily thing. And that's hard. To daily humble yourself. To daily go husband to wife and say, I sinned again, will you forgive me? Wife to husband to forgive yet again for what's happened. Parents to children, children to parents, and on and on and all those interpersonal relationships that we have to humble ourselves and live in that kind of daily repentance. Well, you know, on our own, there's no way we could ever do it. It's only from grabbing on to these amazing promises God has given us that we have the strength to live in that kind of repentance. Grab on to those promises. Grab on to that forgiveness that God freely offers to you and me. And as we better understand His forgiveness of us, we will more freely be able to offer that same forgiveness to others and will be empowered to live in that repentance each day that He so desires. So in faith, motivated by these promises God has given us to grab a hold of, to hold on to, promises of forgiveness and salvation. Leave here today comforted that your place in heaven is guaranteed and strengthened so that you can live daily in that repentance. Do it out of love for your Savior who's done everything for you and for your salvation. Amen.